The crowd spoke up. We've heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, You're going to have the light just a little longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father in heaven, Lord, open up our eyes to see your glory. Lord, open up our ears to hear your word. May we not just hear and not be doers of your word, Lord, but help us to be, hear and obey your word. Help us to be a light to this world. Help us to study your scriptures, Lord, so that we rightly handle your word of truth. And help us to have the joy that Jesus had set before him to, for the cross, Lord that we don't worry about the things of this world other than worry about what your will is, Lord. Not our will, but your will be done in your kingdom come, Father. As we read your scripture today, Lord, fill us with your spirit and guide us into all truth. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I entitled this, What Does a Child of God Look Like? And we read scripture from John chapter 12, verse 34 and 36, because that's part of your reading from this week, so you should have got there. You should have read Ezekiel chapters 11 through 26, and John chapter 10, 20, 10 verse 24, through, through the end of chapter 13. You know, in those chapters, Jesus ends his public ministry, and he starts the private discourse in the upper room. You're not going to quite get finished with John or Ezekiel this week in your reading, but you're going to get really close. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 5 through 8, read this way. For you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us remain awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of our hope of salvation." Now, I could go so many other verses, but I wanted to stop that, start there when I'm describing what a child of light is like, a child of God is like. I'm giving away something by saying a child of light. I'm not supposed to say that necessarily yet, but you know that already. We are not children of darkness. Light extinguishes darkness. The greater that the light is in you, the more that the darkness will be extinguished. Jesus is the light of the world, and he calls you to radiate his light through you. Not to be asleep, to be awake, ready for the battle that we face. And we do fight a spiritual battle. So we need to be sober. We need to put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of our salvation. From Things New and Old, Volume 17, Child of Light, Child of day, Christian, be of Christ the ray. Shining in this world of shame, the brightness of his glorious name. Child of light, this ray impart on the sorrow-stricken heart. Let the orphan feel its glow, the widow all its beauty know. Child of day, let Christ still shine. In every act and word of thine, may thou midst the sorrow worn, the doctrine of Christ adorn. Child of day, thy watchtower keep. Let no slumber o'er thee creep. Clothe thy breast with faith and love and keep the heart of Christ above. Child of light, child of day, the helmet on, the, on thy head display, the helmet of salvation given through him who now is crowned in heaven. Child of light, child of day, Christian, be, a, be of Christ the ray. Mid the scene of ceaseless strife, hold forth the words of life. Do you think we need to do that? today, more today than we probably did yesterday and even more tomorrow. From commentary on McLean, McLaren's expositions, it says, if Christian men and women do not advance in their knowledge and their, in their conformity, like clouds of darkness will fall upon them. None is so hopeless as the unprogressive Christian. 
none so far away as those who have been brought nigh and have never come any nigher. If you believe the light, see that you grow, growingly trust and walk in it, else darkness will come upon you, and you will not know whither you go. Faith and obedience turn a man into the likeness of what he trusts. If we trust Jesus, we open our hearts to him. If we open our hearts to him, we will come, he will come in. If you are in a darkened room, what have you to do in order to have it lifted with the glad sunshine? Open the shutters and pull up the blinds, and the light will do the rest. If you trust the light, it will rush in and fill every crevice and cranny of your hearts. Faith and obedience will mold us by their, by their natural effect into the resemblance of that on which we lean. What thou lovest, thou dost become. Words to ponder as we read through God's scriptures, especially as we read further into John. And we've read several things that Jesus has said already. In John chapter 6, he said, I am the bread of life. You know what that means. John chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 49, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Uh, John, that's 35, I'm sorry. And then skipping down to verse 50, Anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. So Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my, my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my, blood, my, and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. And as you remember from reading in John chapter 6, many disciples turn away from Jesus that day because they are unwilling to do that. That's not the kind of Messiah that they want. They don't want to continue to eat and be nourished in Jesus Christ alone. In verse 68, Simon Peter replied because the disciples turned away and Jesus asked him, were you going to turn away also? And Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Is this what you believe? Jesus answered them and said, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is the devil. He was speaking about Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. For although Judas was one of the twelve, he was later to betray Jesus. And we see unbelief in even the disciples. Now, I want to ask you a question here, and this is going to get a little, we'll get into it a little further. But what did Judas look like at this point? I mean, we know the story of Judas, and we know how he became, but did he look like a child of God at this point? Did he look like a disciple? Did he look like a believer? I mean, John writes later that he was a thief and so forth, but if they would have known at that point, wouldn't they have said something? Wouldn't it be in Scripture at that point? He walked as though he was a child of light. Doesn't Scripture tell you that even Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light? Don't be deceived. In John chapter 7, Jesus says that he offers living water. So we have the bread and we have the blood and we have water. In verse 37, it was the late, last and greatest day of the feast and Jesus stood out and called in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within them. He was, not, he was speaking about the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And we have in that chapter the unbelief of Jewish leaders. So if you believe in Jesus and you're nourished in Jesus and you're eating his flesh and drinking his blood, not physically, but spiritually, if you're doing that, then streams of living water will flow out of you so that others will know the truth. In John chapter 8, verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. Once again, Jesus spoke to the people and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. As Jesus spoke these things, many believed in him. So he said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And we have so much unbelief there that the crowds even try to stone Jesus. But I wanted to remind you here that there is a continuation in God's word. If you're walking in the light 
as Christ is the light, then you continue to walk in the light. You have to be nourished. You have to be feeding upon Him. You have to be offering living water. You can't just feed and be satisfied and not go nourish others as well. You can't have the light shine upon you and you not shine the light to the world. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And then in John chapter 9, we see a warning from Jesus. In John chapter 9, verse 4, while it is daytime... We must, do the, we must do the works of Him who sent me. Did you catch that? We must do the works of the one that sent Jesus because we are His disciples, His followers. If we stay in His Word, if we eat His flesh, if we drink His blood, if living water flows from us like it flowed from the rock in the wilderness, we must do the work while it is daytime because night is coming when no one can work. Verse 5, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, what does that mean to you? Is Jesus here today? In and through you. If your light's not shining, then is Jesus here in the world today? The thief comes. Wait a minute, I'm looking at the wrong place. I'm sorry, my scripture. Then Jesus declared, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind may see and those who see may become blind. We have the story of the blind man, blind from birth, and the first time that he saw light, I cannot even imagine what that would be like for him. I can't imagine the joy that he would have to, to be able to see and the stories that he would tell. I once was blind, but now I see. We must do the work because night is coming when you can't do the work anymore when the light is gone. There is a time coming. Jesus said He would come back and that will be the time that He separates the sheep from the goats. Oh, that's, we're coming up to that, aren't we? I am the gate for the sheep, John chapter 10. Truly, truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the gate, verse 9, if anyone enters through me, he will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. Those who believe enter into the gate. They are part of the fold. They come in and out and go find pasture. We don't just stay here and say we're satisfied, we're saved, we're fine, we're going to ex exclude ourselves and live a life of holiness but not be a part of the world that we live in. We're to be set apart in the world, to be ambassadors, to be witnesses, to be Jesus' hands and feet because we have a story to tell, a story so great that there's no way that we could keep quiet. I don't think that man that got his sight went back to wherever and then didn't tell anyone. If you keep reading in John chapter 10, we've got the next I am. I am the good shepherd in John chapter 10 verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So we've got the gate. If we enter in, we're, we're in his sheep fold, but he's going to lay down his life. What does that mean? And he's setting the example for us that that's how we're supposed to live. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for, my, for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not in this fold. I must bring them in as well and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock and one shepherd. But at this the crowds try to seize Jesus. At least until they hear the next I am, right? Because the next I am you read this week, I am the resurrection and the life. That kind of changes things. Because before, I want a Messiah that's going to save me and everything, but I don't want to have to deny myself and take up my cross and follow after Jesus. I don't want to have to give up my will to serve His will. I want to continue on like I want to do things. I don't want to realize that I'm a new creation in Christ, that I was bought with a price. That's just against my flesh. So I have to feed on Jesus' flesh and His blood. I have to drink living water so that springs of living water flow from me. I have to be filled completely with the light of Jesus so that I can shine in this world. 
I need to make sure that I continue in His Word to show that I am truly His disciple. And that means hearing and obeying. I need to work while there's daylight because night is coming. There's urgency. I am going to enter in through the gate. I'm going to find pasture and rest. And I'm going to come in and out because there is a purpose here. The rest of the sheep need to be brought into the fold. And I have been given the wonderful job of being an ambassador for Jesus Christ to speak His words, to bring the good news to the world. So in John chapter 11, we see that Lazarus is sick and he dies and he's in the grave four days. And Jesus comes to Mary and Martha and He says that in John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in Me will live even though he dies. Verse 26, And everyone who lives... I'll put in for me so you get that. And believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He was asked, if, well, he was told that, that, that he, they, Martha believed that. But she said, I know that God will give you anything that you desire. And he said, I am God. In me you will find life. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live now and forevermore. And even when he dies, he who lives for me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Because if you believe this, it has to change the way you think. You have to repent and turn from your ways of thinking and let God work on that heart that He gave you, that new fleshy heart that He can mold and make and write His words upon. Do you choose to live? So I'll ask the question again, what does a child of God look like? Based off of what we've read right here, what does a child of God look like? Oh, and what about Judas? What does he look like still at this point? He sure looks like a child of God at this point. But is he doing all of these things? Is he feeding? Is he continuing in God's Word? Has he let the light specifically stamp out the darkness? Or is there still some darkness, some things that are entangling him? Has he stripped, as Paul said, stripped everything away? Well, not Paul because it's the author of Hebrews. We don't know, know who it is. Has he stripped everything away that, that he can run this race with perseverance? Or is he still holding on to the darkness. We've read and we know that Nicodemus was holding on to the darkness. He didn't want to come into the light. But as you read further, spoiler alert, he comes to the light. But what about Judas at this point? So Jesus says to the dead man, Lazarus, come out. I love this next verse, verse 44. The man who had been dead came out. And I always like to point this out. With his hands and feet bound in strips of linen and his faith wrapped in cloth. Boy, I'd love to have seen that. I think he just levitated because he was bound up like this. And I think he just went, not moving with his feet, just glided across maybe six inches off the ground. I don't know. Because <laughs> he was bound. He was dead and bound up just like you were dead in your trespasses and sin before you saw the light. And Jesus said, and his face was wrapped in a cloth, and Jesus said, unwrap him and let him go. Now what did he do again? Just like the blind man that couldn't see. What did Lazarus do once he was let go? He told the world about what Jesus had done for him. To the point that the Pharisees and other religious leaders and some of the crowd, because many of them believed that day, whether they truly believed or not, we don't know, but the rest of the crowd went and told the Jewish leaders, and that's when the plot for, to kill Jesus really got underway. Because there's no way that we need, can have this man going around making the claims that he has, and now he's made a claim that says, I am the resurrection and the life, and there's a man that once was dead but now is alive claiming it also. So they vowed to kill Lazarus as well. Are you willing to walk in Jesus, with Jesus no matter what it costs to be a light in this world? Will you come out of the darkness, out from death, and be a child of light? Many believe and many profess, but Jesus also says, depart from me to many of them because He says, I don't know you. 
even those who did mighty works in his name, even cast out demons. So we're to the point where Philip asks Andrew to bring some Greeks to see Jesus. They want to hear about Jesus because all this talk about Jesus, all these signs and wonders that Jesus has done, and remember his claims. That's why I went over his claims so far. And when they come to see Jesus, it's amazing what Jesus says next. Don't miss it. John 12, verse 23. The Greeks are before Jesus. The whole world is before Jesus. He's offering to bring the other sheep into his pen, Jews and Gentiles. And verse 23 starts with a conjunction that your Bible should probably have as a but because it's in contrast to what you've seen before. I bring these people to Jesus and he's, they're expecting him to say one thing, but he says this instead. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now that takes me back to the seeds planted that God came to plant His Word. That is the seed, and it's planted in your heart. But is it planted on a, on a hard-packed soil that the birds just come and take away? Is it planted on a soil that, that grows up, but it grows up with weeds and it's choked out? Does it, is it planted in a soil when things get tough and the sun comes out and beats down on you that you don't have roots big, good enough and you wither and die? Or is it planted on good soil? That heart that God has given you that is pliable, a heart of flesh that He works on, that as you read God's Word, as you eat upon Jesus and drink living water, that it transforms you and changes you through and through. So you don't recognize who you were before and all you look forward to is seeing Jesus and building up things for the kingdom of heaven and you want God's will more than you want your own. So you look for opportunities to do God's will instead of just sitting back and saying, well, if you want me to do this, show me, Lord. But you look for those ways. You can't help but be merciful and kind and fight injustice and everything else. The Jews and the Greeks were expecting a king that would take care of their material needs. But Jesus warns us not to build up treasures here on earth, but to build up treasures in heaven. He goes on to say this, verse 25, Whoever loves his life will lose it. Well, wait a minute. Wasn't Jesus talking about himself when he talked about this kernel of wheat? Wasn't he meaning that he was going to go to the cross and die? Sure he was. But he also says here, also you... Whoever loves his life will lose it. Let that seed be planted in his heart. Let yourself die, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after Jesus. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, and we know what that means about following after Jesus, he must follow me, must. And where I am, my servant will be as well. Is Jesus still in the world today? He is if He's living in you and through you. He said He would never forsake you. He said He would ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit, of which we've already read about that before. That would be the springs of living water that are flowing in you and through you. If anyone serves me, my Father will honor him also. Wow. So we can't lose here, guys. This is a win, 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 win. But why is it so hard to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow after Jesus then? So I ask again, what does a child of God look like? Then Jesus says in verse 27, because he's fully man and he knows what he's undergoing, we still don't comprehend that even today. Not the physical that he underwent, but taking on the sin of all mankind, becoming a sin offering, being put upon a tree and cursed for us so that we could be given life. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? That's what our natural humanly desire would be. Save me from this hour, right? Isn't there another way? Oh, I don't want to have to go through this. It's hard. No. It is for this very purpose that I have come to this hour. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Not my kingdom, but your kingdom, God. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. What does that mean to you? 
read the scripture. Jesus said, I'm going to die. If you're a true follower of me, you're going to die also. Not physically necessarily, but could happen. But spiritually, to your wills and your desires to be like Jesus in this world. And if you do, you will be honored by the Father in heaven. Is it easy? No. Shall I say, save me from this? No. Because Jesus called me to this very hour, and if I don't let the light take the darkness out, I could wind up just like Judas. You think he thought that's how he would wind up? So God says, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again by your obedience, by your faith, by your walk, by your, your testimony, by your light, by your good deeds. What does a child of God look like? How about this question? Do you and I look like children of God? The crowd standing there, verse 29, heard it and said, well, it must be thunder. Others said, angels had spoken. In response, Jesus said, this voice was not for my benefit. He's the one that cried out and said, hey, should I say, take me from this hour? No, this is why I came, but it was for your benefit. So you understand what Jesus went through so that when you go through the things in this world, you'll know that Jesus hadn't forsaken you and given you the power to go through it. And you know that what stands on the other side of glory is much better than what these present momentary afflictions are. Now judgment has come upon this world. The, now the prince of this world will be cast out and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. This voice was for your benefit. Judgment has come into the world. Satan has no more power upon you. Judgment is here now. The prince of this world will be cast out. If you study scripture here, and in the way this is, sit, this is the Berrien Study Bible that I'm reading from. I don't know what yours says. But it says the prince of this world will be cast out. It's a continual verb. Because Satan is still in this world. But wait a minute. Judgment is upon this world. Judgment between whether you're going to choose right or wrong. And Satan has been judged. His power has been stripped from him. Because Christ dies for your sin. He has no power, no authority in your life. But he will be cast out by how you live a life of faith. That's why we pray your kingdom come. Your will be done. Because we're ushering in the kingdom of heaven by the way we live as children of the Most High. He said to in, this to indicate the kind of death he was going to die, that he went willingly to die to pay the price once and for all for all of mankind's sins. Verse 34, the crowd replied, We have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever. So how can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, look at his answer, Who is Jesus to you? For a little while longer the light will be among you. Okay, we know that Jesus is referring to himself that came into the world so that we could see the light and be children of light. So he says, walk. That's what a child of light would do, right? While you have the light so that darkness will not overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light. What? So that you may be children of light. Now that doesn't mean just because Jesus is here physically in the world, that means that His presence is here in the world. Because Jesus is still in the world. That's why I asked you that. He is living in and through you. So as long as Jesus is still in the world, then we have a chance to walk in light. Because when Jesus returns, there won't be that chance anymore. Judgment will come. Jesus says He didn't come for judgment at this point. He came for salvation. For a little while longer, we still have day. So we should walk as children of the day, children of light, because darkness night is coming. Do you understand the urgency? Do you understand your position to love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself? And we're going to get to John chapter 13 in just a minute where Jesus tells us how to love and how we'll be known. Not to just profess Jesus with our lips, but that our hearts have to be there so that our actions are there, so that our faith is, shows that our, our works show that our faith is true, that we don't have a life that says we have faith but is dead because we don't have works. 
After Jesus had spoken these things, he went away and hid and was hidden from them. So this is the end of his public ministry as you're reading. Or is it? Although Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still did not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the Lord, arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they were unable to believe. Wow. Different sermon altogether. But there comes a time when your heart is hardened so much like you th look back at Pharaoh and you cannot believe anymore. Oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, listen to the Holy Spirit when He's talking to you. You don't want for the God not to, to, to answer you. For again, Isaiah says, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they cannot see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about Him. All of the Old Testament as we're reading through Ezekiel and everything points to Jesus and His glory. You know the reality of Jesus, God giving His only Son to die for you. Nevertheless, many of the leaders believed in Him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess Him for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. Were they saved then? They're still in darkness at least, right? They didn't come out into the light. They weren't a child of light. They certainly weren't living like a child of God would live. I don't know. I'm not here to condemn. I'm not here to judge. But if you believe and you don't profess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, then I don't believe that you're saved. I don't know man's heart though, but God does and you can't hide from Him and you can't change the fact. How is your heart? Is there any darkness there that you need to get rid of? Verse 44, then Jesus cried out. I thought he was gone. Scripture said for before he went away and hid from them. He saw that many believed, but he knew them again. Go way back to John chapter 2 when he said he didn't have any part of them because, they, because he knew they didn't truly believe, even though it says many believed, he didn't believe in them. Here he comes out because he knows that some people have believed, in my opinion, but are afraid to come out. They stay in darkness. What the... What the pitiful state of a Christian who continues to stay in darkness. I cannot imagine that. Sure, they might be saved. Again, different sermon series altogether. But to know that you lived a life that did not profess Jesus Christ because of your lust for the flesh or your fear of men? Wow. So Jesus cried out. Sorry, guys. Whoever believes in me does not believe in me alone, but in the one who sent me. And whoever sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that no one who believes in me should remain in the darkness. As for anyone who hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge them. For I have, come to the, I have not come to judge the world, but to save the world." There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not receive my words. The words that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. I have not spoken on my own, but the Father who sent me has commanded me to say and how to say it. And I know his commands lead to eternal life. So I speak exactly what the Father has told me to say. There's the end of Jesus' public ministry. He's not in the upper room yet. One last passionate cry. Because from here out, all you're going to yell is crucify me. So I'm going to cry out one last time. Please, please come to the bread of life. Please come and drink living water. Please let the light come in and stamp out the darkness. Enter through the gate. I am the good shepherd. I'm going to lay down my life for the sheep. Do you believe this? Don't have a head knowledge. Don't have a half-hearted belief. Believe in Ezekiel, we saw that through him, God continually warned his children about the coming judgment. But what did they do? They hardened their hearts. They turned back from healing. And they brought judgment upon themselves and their children. Remember that. When Scripture talks about your children and your children's children and the heritage they are. That's why it is so important for us to go into the Wana ministry. 
loving the Lord and with a desire to teach these children, praying for them. God continues to show how faithful He is and His glory even leaves the temple and goes to them in captivity. He will not forsake His children. What a loving, faithful God. And I want to read you a little bit from Ezekiel 18. Verse 20, The soul who sins is the one who will die. A son will not bear the iniquity of his father, and a father will not bear the iniquity of his son. The righteous of the righteous man will fall upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked man will fall upon him. But if the wicked man turns from all the sins he commits, keeps all my statues, and does what is just and right, he shall surely live. He will not die. The problem is, is we are wicked, and we can't completely turn, can we? So we need a Savior. Thank goodness for Jesus Christ. It's going to, no matter how we try to do it by our works alone, we cannot do it. Verse 22, none of the transgressions he has committed will be held against him because the, righteous he has, the righteousness he has practiced, he will live. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God? Wouldn't I prefer that he turn from his ways and live? But if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and practices iniquity, committing the same abominations as a wicked, wicked he, will he live? None of the righteous acts that he did will be remembered. Because of the unfaithfulness and sin he has committed, he will die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O house of Israel, is it my, is it my way that is unjust? Is it not your ways that are unjust? If a righteous man is turned from his righteousness and practice iniquity, he will die for this. He will die because of the iniquity he has committed. But if a wicked man turns from the wickedness he has committed and does what is just and right, he will save his life. Because he considered and turned from all the transgressions he committed, he will surely live and he will not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The ways of the Lord is not just. Are my ways unjust, O house of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? Therefore, O house of Israel, I will judge you, each according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, so that your iniquity will not become your downfall. Cast away from yourself all the transgressions you have committed, and fashion for yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why should you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in anyone's death, declares the Lord. So repent and live. Now, if you apply that to Jesus Christ and you know you can't save yourself, you realize the sin debt that you cannot pay and that Jesus paid it all and He passionately cried out and said, Come to me. Why do we partially come to Him? Why do we hold back anything from Him? Why do we go back to our wicked ways? Why do we longingly hold on? Why do we not trust God that He will give us everything that we need? Why do we worry about those things that the Gentiles continue to worry about? What we're going to wear, what we're going to eat. And as we look at the example of the new church, they did not worry about those things. Even persecution and suffering. So here we are today in the United States which looks a lot more like Babylon than in God we trust. How are we living as children of light? Or are we letting the darkness creep in? Ezekiel even experiences the loss of the desire of his eyes. Did you read that? But God says, I'm taking your wife. You don't have to understand this. He's laid on his side and, co and cooked food and ate it over poop. He's t cried out to them time and time again, and now God says, I'm taking your wife. And don't mourn. Don't grieve. And I'm thinking as I'm reading all this, how much God mourned because of the loss of His Son, but how much He rejoiced because of those who would accept Jesus Christ. I don't know all the Lord's ways. I don't, I'm not going to give you an answer for why God took Ezekiel, <laughs> his wife. But he's sovereign. His ways are higher than ours. Ours Take you back and read Job and that where uh, against all the calamities and all the things and death there and everything else, he didn't curse God. 
just because of God, who He is alone, we have a holy standard to be obedient to Him, but we can't keep it. But Jesus did keep it for you. He was the blameless, spotless Lamb that laid down His life for His sheep. Do you listen to His voice? Do you come in and come out and find pasture and water for your souls? And do you bring other sheep into the fold? Ezekiel 24, then the people asked me, won't you tell us what these things you're doing mean to, mean to us? So I answered them, the word of the Lord came to me saying, tell the house of Israel that this is what the Lord God says. I am about to desecrate my sanctuary. The pride of your power, the desires of your eyes, and the delight of your soul. What is the pride of your power? Is it your strength, your health, your, health, your children? your money, your prestige, or is it God and God alone? What are the desires of your eyes? Is it Jesus Christ and nothing else? What is the delight of your soul? Are you living for Jesus? Do you take your salvation seriously? Are you really living for Him, shining brightly in this world? So John chapter 13, we have the example of love. Right? Starts out this way in John chapter 13 as we just ended John chapter 12 before I read you from Ezekiel. It was now just before the Passover feast and Jesus knew that His hour had come to leave this world and return to His Father. Having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them till the very end. He was driven and motivated by love for you and I. Even those who spit upon Him who mocked him, who beat him. He loved them, even Judas. The evening meal was underway and the devil had already entered the heart of Judas. And Jesus didn't stop loving him, didn't stop offering to him a chance to repent. The, the devil had already put into the heart of Jesus, Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. What's in your heart? What does a child of God look like? He shines brightly for Jesus Christ. I think I've set up my argument for that. So then you've got to say, is that what I look like? Or do I look a lot like Judas? I wonder when it was in his heart at that point if he realized what he was going to do at that point or that just he had reached the point of no return. I don't think he still realized at that point until he did what he did. Because still, until he did what he did, he still could have changed his mind. But, but not if his heart was hardened too far, could he? Because then it's not our part anymore. Like I said, different sermon. But like the betrayer, that's what I'm going to call him, we hold on to things in our heart. Like money, possessions, success, even our children and grandchildren. We choose what we want before we answer the call of Jesus. I hear your call in my life, O oh Lord, and as soon as my children are raised, I will do this. As soon as I get this done, I will do this. Judas was called by Jesus. He answered the call. He was sent out by Jesus. Don't forget that. And they cast out demons in His name and everything. He went. There's no sign of Him staggering in His faith or anything like that. He went with authority and power. Sure looks like a child of God, doesn't it? However, the light of Jesus never extinguished the darkness. He never truly entered in through the gate. He did not hear his shepherd's voice. He kept hearing the voice of another. The prince of this world whose power has been destroyed, that we has no authority and dominion in our life whatsoever. So what light Judas had, whatever light it was, it faded into the darkness. Why in his case it was the love of money? Oh, wait a minute. Isn't that kind of what all these things are about? The love of money is the root of all evil because if we didn't think we had to have the money to do these things, we wouldn't worry about these things in the first place, would we? Maybe we should just get rid of all of our money and just love each other and provide for each other. And Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> what holds the purse strings, since we call it money, to your heart? Judas did what many children do. He tried to make God into his image rather than let God mold him into his image. 
His heart was not responsive and soft and did not change. And he died in his sins. Jesus came face to face with Jesus and he, deci- he had to decide in his heart who Jesus was. Did he realize what Jesus was truly offering him? Do you realize how great this salvation is? Do you work it out with fear and trembling? Why didn't he truly answer the call? He did all these other things, saw the mighty powers of of Jesus. Even through himself, he saw the powers of the Holy Spirit work. But he made a choice. We all have choices to make. And in John 13, verse 30, it says, Judas went out into the darkness because he never let go of the darkness. Before that happened, though, Jesus said to his disciples, including Judas, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. About washing his feet. And you can take this all kind of different ways. You can say as we go through ministry and and life, our feet get dirty and they need to be washed. That's true. But more than anything, it's just the humble act of servanthood that Jesus was showing to them. That was the lowest job for anybody to do, wash their dirty feet, because they did walk in the streets where animals defecated and everything. Their feet got dirty. Yep, and their feet got dirty as they were walking about, coming in and out of pasture and following after Jesus, yes. But Jesus said they'd already been washed. He said whoever has already bathed needs only to wash his feet. That continual turning back to Jesus and getting washed by Jesus, eating his flesh, drinking his blood, praying to the Spirit, letting the Spirit fill you, trusting being united with one another in Christ. Whoever has bathed needs only to wash his feet, and then he'll be completely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. Wait a minute. If I am clean, why do I need my feet washed? Because Jesus said to follow in his pattern. He washed the disciples' feet because it was a lowly job, and he told them to go do whatever lowly job it was to serve the kingdom of God. Though not all of you, because Judas, even though he was bathed, even though his feet were washed, he never came into the light. There are plenty of goats in the sheep pen that act like sheep, but they will be separated. Only the sheep will stay in the sheep pen. What does a child of God look like? A child of light in this world, of course. John 13, verse 12, Jesus When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garment, he reclined with them again and asked, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, because that's who I am. So if I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, what? You should think about it, right? You also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example so that you should do as I have done for you. Judas sitting there. Truly, truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, so don't think that you are. No messenger, oh, I'm a messenger also, is greater than the one who sent him. You know these things, you know them, and you will be blessed if you do them. Blessed. Be in right standing with God. Blessings that you cannot even think about. Blessings upon blessings upon blessings. Judas was there the whole time. Do you know where Judas was sitting? Did you study Scripture that much to be an approved workman who rightly handles the word of truth? You can't find it here in John, but you'll find it in Matthew, and it doesn't say it just point blank. You have to understand it. Maybe you can look at Leonardo's picture and stuff. But John was sitting beside him on one side because John says that. Judas was sitting at the place of honor on Jesus' side. He gave him the place of honor. That's what he's offering you. Will you accept it or will you go out into the night? Peter wasn't sitting there. Why was Judas sitting at the place of honor? He'd already, he'd already warned his disciples, and, but he sat him there. He gave him every opportunity to be a child of light. Verse 31, when, Jesus, when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. There was only light left in the room. The rest would shine their light. It would cost them their life. 
If God is glorified in Him, God will also glorify the Son in Himself and will glorify Him at once. Little children. Scripture is specific. That's why it says it here. Little children. You should have that childlike faith. Not worry about anything else. Know that when Daddy throws you up in His arms, He will catch you. And it'll be fun while it's doing because you'll go, wee. But you'll have no fear of falling and dropping, nothing else. Little children, I am only with you a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, which we know it's not new. We know that we're supposed to love one another. But here's the new part. As I have loved you, because now you've seen the promise of the Old Testament saints, all the faith that they live for, the hope that they have in Jesus Christ. And you get the privilege of carrying that message to the world. And only can our faith be made complete, as Hebrews says, through all of this saving grace that God gives us, this plan of salvation that you get to live and breathe and tell others. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this action that you do, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So what does a child of God look like? Child of light, right? I said it earlier. I kind of... Is there only light in your life? Okay. I'm not asking. I'm reading you scripture. I'm telling you what I had to examine this week. And I know there's darkness in my life. And I pray that God takes it away. I certainly worry about my grandchildren. But I try to put that he's sovereign. And I pray for them. And I try to, as Hebrews 11 says, by holy fear, dismiss this world and become a preacher of righteousness and build that ark to save my family. So how are you doing? I'm going to ask you a few questions. And they're from Scripture. If you want to read later, Matthew chapter 5 is where these questions come from. Hmm, let's see, the Sermon on the Mount, verses 13 to 19. Do you realize that you're the salt of the earth? Right? How are you enhancing and flavoring this world then? Are you preserving it? Or are you letting it spoil and rot? Do you realize that you're the light of the world? Do you ever hide it? Does it shine for all to see? Not just some. Even that person. What good deeds are you doing that are glorifying your Father which is in heaven? Oh, and from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 25, are you storing up treasures in heaven or here on earth? If the eye is the lamp of the body... Is there any darkness in you? If there is, how great is the darkness? Do you realize that you can only serve one master? Do you love or trust in money? Do you worry about the things of this world? Do the birds? Doesn't God provide for them? So I looked at different things this week. And then didn't find a lot of what I was looking for because a lot of it's just so watered down. <laughs> but what does a child of light look like? What things do you do? But I come across a couple articles that really got me thinking. And I've made these up on my own. For you ladies, I'll give you an example. I don't know how close to reality I'll come or not. You got this new car that your husband and you've gone out and picked, you've been saving up for years, and you know this single mother down the street, and you've got this vacation plan with your family, you're going to go take this vacation, and you're taking your new minivan, and her wife tries, and she doesn't have a reliable car to take her to Denver to see her the funeral of her mother. Do you offer your car? Do you cancel your trip? I'm going extremes, okay? For you gentlemen who work and everything and you've got a promotion and you've, you've worked hard in your life and you deserve the promotion you've got and you've been there 15 or 20 years 
And there's a new guy that comes in that's a, a single dad that's struggling. He's up for the promotion also. Do you back out of it and say, take the job? I'm telling you again, these are extremes. I'm not trying to be pushy on you or anything else. But is your thought process, even on the extremes, into what would bring God glory and trusting Him so that your light shines brightly? Father in heaven, I do thank you and praise you for you are an amazing, amazing God who would create us knowing that we would rebel against you, knowing that it would cost you your son's life, that Jesus gave up heaven, humbled himself to become flesh and blood, to be taken care of by human parents, to wander through this world without a place to lay his head so that he could present the truth to those who would hear it. Lord, may we see the light. May our blindness be taken away. May we not go from what we think we can see into blindness. But may we trust in the light while Jesus is presenting the light to us so that we can be children of light. Father, I just thank you and praise you for your amazing grace, for the love that you have for us. The fact that Jesus would never, ever forsake us, that he's here with us every single day, that there is nothing that we need that you won't provide. May we trust in you and build up treasures in heaven rather than here on earth. May we be the hands and feet of Jesus everywhere, anywhere, and everywhere that we can with a joyful heart. I thank you for this loving church. I thank you for being a part of a body that fellowships and trusts in you, Lord, and, and who is light in this world. And I thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.